You're listening to The Leonard Lopez Show on AM820 and 93.9 WNYC. Whether he's writing about the stock market, competition in nature, Islam, or even rock music, Howard Bloom has a seems to have a knack for stirring things up. So it shouldn't come as a surprise then that his latest book follows that pattern and is arguably his most ambitious yet. In The God Problem, How a Godless Cosmos Creates, Mr. Bloom lays out his ideas about the life cycle of the universe and takes a crack at explaining some of of science's most fundamental mysteries. In the process, he weaves in anecdotes about history, mathematics, and even some of his own story. It's published by Prometheus Books, and I'm very pleased that it brings Howard Bloom back to our show. Hello. Thanks, Leonard. When you were here last, it was to discuss your book on the 2009 stock market crash. But even before that, hadn't you worked in the music industry? Yes. I I started in science at the age of 10 in microbiology and theoretical physics, and then decided what I wanted to understand was mass human behavior, mass behavior in general. And eventually, after spending half my life in science, which is easy to do when you start at 10, I dove off in what seemed to be another direction and started eventually what became the biggest. It, it was a field I knew nothing about, but I started the biggest PR firm in the music industry. Had a heavy metal magazine at one I, time? Yes, I took over a magazine. I did not. I was asked to edit it. I did not ask what the magazine was about. You just thought it'd be fun to uh, to edit a magazine. Well, when I was 12, Albert Einstein, in the introduction to a book, had said he'd grab me by the lapel. You know that feeling when somebody, the author, really speaks directly to you. And he said, look, Schmuck, if you want to be a genius, it's not enough to come up with a theory only seven men in the world can understand. You have to be able to come up with a theory only seven men in the world can understand that expresses it so clearly that anyone with a high school education can understand it. So the task was, to be a scientific thinker, you have to be a writer. In this book, you write about a young boy from Buffalo, New York, who's uh, consumed by science and turns to it for comfort as he prepares for his bar mitzvah. I'm assuming that's you. Yes. But you said you started in theoretical science, physics at 10? Yes, yes. I I was sitting in a great big empty living room. The drapes were closed, even though it was 3 in the afternoon. There was a book in my hand that I had never seen before. None of the kids in Buffalo wanted ever to have anything to do with me. And suddenly I opened this book, and it says look you, it sort of grabs him by the lapels. And it says, the first two rules of science are these, the truth at any price, including the price of your life. And it gives the example of Galileo incorrect, but told in the way that would grab my desire for courage. And second rule of science, look at things right under your nose as if you've never seen them before and then proceed from there. And it gave the example of Anton von Leeuwenhoek, who invented the microscope. Another person who grabbed me, though the story wasn't quite told correctly. And That was it. I had a a gang of people who accepted me, and so I started in theoretical physics, which is where Galileo took me, and in microscopy and microbiology, which is where von Leeuwenhoek took me. Well, how do you see this book when you compare it to your others? Is it philosophy, science, and do you think of yourself as a scientist, a philosopher, or a PR professional, which you were for a large portion of your life? Well, I actually see myself as a scientific thinker, and I'm trying to bring original thought to science, and I've actually been doing that since I was a kid. Um, So this book has philosophy. Philosophy is extremely important. In fact, it has a lot of the stuff you'd call metaphysics. It's just I'm hoping you never notice that you're having the kind of deep thoughts um, that metaphysics would imply. In 2006, you founded a group called the Space Development Steering Committee. What's that organization? The space, uh, America suffers from a severe uh, vision deficit. We don't see a paradise over the horizon that we could help humanity achieve. And Buzz Aldrin yanked me, but physically this time, in person. Not by the lapels. Not by the lapels. You know, not reading. wearing a jacket. Yeah, right. And, uh, and basically asked me to start a group. And the group is the Space Development Steering Committee. And it's there to give us a vision implant so that we can see the paradise that's waiting in the skies eight minutes above our heads. Although uh, the space program has been cut back. So are we going to have to wait a little longer, won't we? Um, with there, there's a positive and a negative going on. Right now, uh, the space program has been held at a $17 billion a year budget. And there's a group that Buzz calls the Darth Vaders. This is the military-industrial space complex who are trying to grab the whole bundle and run with it for, them, for their own purposes and make rockets that are too expensive to fly 
I mean, you can't afford to fly something. It doesn't do you much good. And there's a guy out on the West Coast named Elon Musk who runs a company called SpaceX. He's actually getting rockets up there at 40% less than any of the big boys have ever been, ever been able to achieve. So right now, my group is rooting for Elon Musk like crazy because getting people into space at $23,000 per pound, which means three-quarters of a billion dollars to get you and your oxygen and food into space, that's unaffordable. But Elon promises to bring it down to $10 a pound, and he's the only one that does. I have to lose some weight then. Uh, (laughs) This book has very little to do with religion, so why have you put God in the title? Because at the age of 12, reading Bertrand Russell, I suddenly discovered after two and a half years of reading two books a day in science that I was an atheist. And the job became, okay, you little thing. If you're going to be an atheist and going to deny God's existence in the universe, then how did all the amazing things in this universe happen? If no God said, let there be light, how did we get so much light? If no God parted the heavens and the seas, how did we get heavens and seas? On the other hand, you uh, are critical of the the guys you call the scientific atheists, uh, like Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, Daniel Dennett, Sam Harris. Uh, yes. What are, what are they doing wrong? They're dogmatists. Um, they have taken atheism and turned it into a new religion and a very intolerant one at that. The atheism that I've been holding on to since I was 12 is tolerant and pluralistic and looks at the value of what other people are using as their tools of thought. What would you have said to Marco Rubio when he said, uh, well, he was asked about the age of the universe. Yeah. And he said, it's, well, it's an argument between theologians. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, my God, poor baby. Uh, No, if that's where he wants to argue, that's fine. Everybody's got a right to their own belief system, but please don't let him loose on the budget of the National Institute of Health or NASA. You make frequent references to something you call cosmic creativity. What do you mean by that? Well, once upon a time, there was no cosmos whatsoever, and all of a sudden, blip, a little thing infinitely smaller than a pinprick appeared, and it had qualities, this cosmos, there was no cosmos, but qualities of the nothingness had ever seen. Space, time, energy. What? Space, time, and energy? There was no space before the Big Bang. Well, it created it, space. It depends on whether you have a cyclical view of the universe or a non-cyclical view. But even if you have a cyclical view and the universe starts with a Big Bang and then explodes and then ends up in another Big Bang, where did this cycle of Big Bangs come from? Why Big Bangs? Again, why space? Why time? Why energy? When the first matter com- came precipitating out of a sheet of space and time like hail precipitating from a storm cloud, what? How does time and space become quarks and leptons? How does it become matter? There are these giant creative leaps at every stage of the cosmos evolution. And if we can't account for those, hey, we ain't scientists, because science has the object of becoming omniscient. In the long run, that's the the goal of science. You also called our cosmos a social cosmos. What makes it social? We've been talking about things as if they exist in isolation, particles, cells, humans. And no particle, cell, or human has ever existed in isolation. Leonard, when that first spurt of space and time came out of the Big Bang, and when it precipitated in things, the first quarks, those things came complete with social rules, social rules of engagement. They knew who they had to cozy up to and who they had to run away from. Those are the rules of attraction or repulsion. And those quarks had to exist in groups of three, or they could not exist at all. Hmm. The same thing happened... One band, one kind of trio of quarks is a neutron. Another kind is a proton. Neutrons have a social rule. If they don't engage with another proton, with a proton, in the first 10.6 minutes of their existence, they're over and out in this universe. They collapse. They dissolve. They decay. Yesterday, uh, a theoretical physicist at Caltech, Sean Carroll, was on our show to discuss the Higgs boson particle, and he said that scientists know scientists know that it was present at the Big Bang, but your theory doesn't make any mention of uh, the Higgs boson. No, it doesn't make any mention at all. It doesn't even mention, it, it implies, but doesn't mention the standard model of particle physics from which the Higgs boson comes. And the real big question is not Higgs boson yes or Higgs boson no. The real question is how in the world do things like a Higgs boson come to be to begin with? And you have an idea? Yes. 
um, when I put you in my shoes, and when you're 19 years old, your parents shipped you off to Reed College, and it's a it's a school that has the high, highest median SATs of any school in the country, and on the first day of school, or f- first day of class in math, your teacher walks into the room with a small sheaf of papers, hands them to the student on her right, and they get handed around the conference table. They have 165 words on them, just 165 words, and from those 165 words for the rest of the year, Every week, you will derive a new corollary, a new set of implications, a new set of things that those 165 words imply. And by the end of the year, you'll have the entire course of mathematics um, that you've taken in eight years of school. So the big question is, does the universe do an equivalent thing? Well, he couldn't have put that on a tweet. He would have been a few <laughs> no. words over. Uh, was yes. iteration one of the words uh, on that page? Because you no. called iteration one of the keys to cosmic creativity. Right. The word iteration wasn't around yet. And yet iteration, in other words, repeating the same thing over and over and over again. By repeating the same thing over and over again, you change the context within which you utter that word the next time. And when you utter something in a new context, you change its meaning. And sometimes you get something even bigger than a changed meaning. Sometimes you get emergent properties that will flat out flabbergast you. So we get a kind of a repetition with changes. Right. Um, And how does uh, that relate to cosmic creativity? Well, if you start out with a universe with simple rules... Uh, those things that you looked at at Reed College, the 165 words, those well, were... Well, I didn't go to Reed. Well, I, yes. I, no, I put you in I my stuck, place. I stayed here baby. in New York City. Yes, but uh, but those 165 words that you're dealing with, if you're put in the position of being the poor reader of this book, um, those 165 words are five simple rules. They're called Piano's axioms. The big question is, what's an axiom? And what is an, uh, it, an axiom is an assumption you discover when you do the history. Because this book is a detective story, trying to find out what an axiom is, why things are implicit in an axiom, where the concept of axioms came from. So you, you're making the point that even the most complex systems are just elaborations or variations on a few basic rules? We're still getting to the point where we can answer that question. Let's call that a hypothesis. And that is one of the hypotheses of the book. Why doesn't interest in the God problem have a longer history since thinkers have been pondering similar questions for ages? Yes, you would think, uh, and I thought, that this question went way back in history. So I looked at the obvious suspects. Kepler, no, it turns out he's a creationist. Um, He believes that the world was created in seven days, pretty much as it says in the Bible. Um, He believes that he's using his form of math, which is geometry, to understand the mind of God, the creative process of God. Um, Then you have Galileo. Well, of course he's got to have asked this question, right? No, Galileo was a creationist, too. He believed that the world was created in seven days. Yes, he believed that there were certain inaccuracies in the holy books, and they were there, he said, for a reason, because these books were propaganda pieces written to appeal to the mind of the masses. But God has a second book, he says, and that second book is nature. So read nature using the tools of geometry, you'll understand what's in God's mind. Um, Newton is also a And Newton is even more so. Newton has hosts living in heavens, and he has uh, saints living in the heavens. He has one of the most wildly populous heavens you've ever seen in your life. So it isn't until very recently that we came to the conclusion that we've got a cosmos here that creates itself. Now, how much of this was that these people were believers, and how much was it simply fear that if they said the wrong thing, they'd get in trouble? Darwin uh, didn't publish his ideas for a long time. Right. In fact, he, only when he felt he was forced to publish them, because he was afraid of the reaction of people who uh, believed in the creationist concept. Well, if you look at the 17th and 18th century, when all of these people were doing their works on the 16th century, what you discover is that God was as much taken for granted as the solidity of the table right in front of my fingertips is taken for granted. There's, it would take a lot of scholarship to go back through the works and prove definitively that all of these people believe deeply in their God, but certainly all of the indications are they believe very powerfully in their gods, especially Newton. What a, he was a God-obsessed person. My guest is Howard Bloom. His latest book is The God Problem, How a Godless Cosmos Creates. It is published by Prometheus Books. We'll continue our conversation after we take a little break. Stay with us. <laughs>
Later on in the show, find out why some psychotherapists are now branding themselves to attract more patients and what that means for the treatments they provide. Plus, Christine Nielsen, David Hyde Pierce, and Sigourney Weaver talk about their roles in Christopher Durang's latest comedy, Vanya and Sonia and Masha and Spike. This is WNYC, WNYC WNYC.org. We're also available as a podcast, and you can find me on Facebook and Twitter. WNYC is supported by the Irish Repertory Theater, celebrating its 25th anniversary season with Phil Coulter in The Songs I Love So Well, now through December 30th, and It's a Wonderful Life, a live radio play, December 5th through 30th, irishrep.org or 212-727-2737. Raiseachild.us, encouraging the lesbian and gay community to build families through fostering and adoption. Hosting an information event on December 6th at the New York City Fire Museum, featuring comedian Alec Malpa. More information at raiseachild.us. US. The next New York Public Radio Board of Trustees meeting will be Wednesday, December 5th at 8 a.m. at the New York Times Building, 620 8th Avenue, 43rd floor. Open to the public. Details at 646-829-4000 or WNYC.org. What's the first thing New Yorkers think about when they hear the name Beethoven? The dog movie. A dog. Dog. A dog. The movie with the big dog. Vienna, we have a problem. Raise your Beethoven awareness today with WQXR, New York's classical music station. November is Beethoven Awareness Month at 105.9 FM and WQXR.org. We're back with Howard Bloom, his latest book, The God Problem, How a Godless Cosmos Creates, published by Prometheus Books. Uh, This uh, actually is a bit of a departure for you. Your other books have uh, not really dealt much with science. They've dealt with economics, with music, and other things. Have you been putting this off, or has this, uh, are these ideas, uh, have they just been brewing in your brain uh, to the point now where you finally felt you could put them on paper? Well, actually, all four books have been deeply involved in science. The first book, The Lucifer Principle, A Scientific Expedition into the Forces of History, is about how groups operate as collective processing units, as brains, and compete with each other, and how that produces a larger brain and the violence and evil that that can produce. The second book, Global Brain, the Evolution of Mass Mind from the Big Bang to the 21st Century, was about the biology underlying the way a worldwide wet net has been operating for three and a half billion years without the electronic apparatus. Um, The third book, The Genius of the Beast, A Radical Revision of Capitalism, seemed as if it was deviating from the course of science, original science thinking, but it wasn't. If you're interested in mass behavior, then you've got to be ma- in, interested in, in economics. So this is all about mass behavior yes, one way or another. Exactly. Or what, exactly. what we talked earlier about, the social aspect. Right. Um, you say that your philosophy central question asks how the cosmos creates. Yes. The creation of new stars and planets we're talking about, or also about the fact that the universe is expanding and quickening. Well, it's all of that, because there's a new theory at the end of the book that I hesitated to put in the book. It's a new theory of the beginning, middle, and end of the universe, and it explains a little mystery called dark energy. It explains another little mystery called the CPT symmetry problem, the charge parity time symmetry problem. And um, I came up with it at the age of 16 and threw it away as comic book science. And then one prediction that made came true in 1980 when Alan Guth came up with the concept of inflation, that the universe coming out of the Big Bang expands at an incredibly fast rate. And then in 1998, Adam Reese and a, a crew of about 15 collaborators won a Nobel Prize for discovering that at a certain point the universe begins to accelerate. It begins to speed up. The galaxies start gaining speed as if you were driving them with a Porsche engine and you put your foot on the gas pedal. All of that is explained by what's called Big Bagel Theory. And Big Bagel Theory, as I said, I came up with when I was working at the world's largest cancer research facility. Well, this research is the same facility. as what other people call the donut. Yes, it's a donut. Uh, uh, but, uh, but as a New Yorker, you made it into yes, a bagel? Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, and, uh, as a, a Jewish Buffalonian, I made it into a bagel. At any rate, it does explain all of this stuff, and it's been very well received so far. Well, but you're saying that it will accelerate and then it will slow down? and then No, it'll... it works so It's almost like that. The universe comes... Imagine a bagel with an anally retentive tiny little hole. Now, at the moment of the Big Bang, a positive 
uh, universe, the universe of normal matter, comes spurting out of the top of the bagel's hole. On the bottom of the bagel, we have an antimatter universe, equal but opposite universe. Those two universes fly away from each other at incredible speed. That's what the ship, the steep slopes of a bagel indicate as speed. Then they slow down. That's when the bagel's hump goes into a sort of semi-horizontal curve. Um, and then the bagel slope gets steep again because the two universes start hurtling toward each other out on the bagel's periphery. Why? Why would they accelerate? Because they're attracted by each other's gravity. They're falling into each other's arms. And this is your idea? Yes. Are there other scientists who go along with this? Um, not precisely. Um, there are other bagel versions uh, of the universe, and but they've all been discarded. They're, none of them are like this one, Leonard. None of them at all. You also draw upon uh, isomorphic symbol sets uh, oh, yes. that were proposed by... Uh, someone named Reed Kunstler. He he was a uh, a graduate student when he came up with the idea. Right. Um, and uh, can you explain that? Well, um, right now you're looking at your microphone. You're able to see your microphone. Your microphone or the photons um, are pouring into your irises, being transduced into chemical and electrical signals. Um, in your eye, being sent to the back of your eye, being compressed into yet another uh, chemical and electronic language. Well, every single one of these language translations we're talking about is an isomorphic symbol set. Those photons are being represented by those signals that your retinal receptors are giving off. Then they're being represented in a different language by the signal that goes up your optic nerve, heavily compressed. Then that signal is sorted into between 20 and 40 uh, different streams going to different optic centers, and every one of those is an isomorph, similar to a, a, uh, um, a synonym for um, that original set of signals that came from that microphone into your eye. So the universe operates by repeating herself and representing herself over and over again in different forms, especially since the advent of DNA three and a half billion years ago. So this, this explains some of the God problem for you? Yes, because what you find is that... Um, at the very beginning, you have a nothing translated into a, a something. That's the first Big Bang. Um, then, in coming from this giant sheet of space and time, you have space and time translated into quarks. Then you have quarks translated into neutrons and protons. They're all isomorph, isomorphs of each other, and yet they all have something dramatically new. Now, I became curious about uh, Reed Consler because of this book, uh, and I found that he currently works as a chemistry teacher at a high school in Western Massachusetts. Yes, I'm amazed. How did you come across his research uh, and, and the paper uh, which he published? Because uh, the ideas don't seem to have been peer-reviewed. Uh, no, I... Um, I ran a group, I ran two scientific, look, I was very sick and stuck in bed for 15 years. And while I was stuck in bed, I started two international scientific groups. The first was called the Group Selection Squad, and its goal was to legitimize the concept of group selection, which was considered a heresy in evolutionary biology and evolutionary psychology. Reed, I believe, was a part of that group. Then I started in 1997 the International Paleopsychology Project, which was a, a, a group out to trace the history of thinking, emoting, and socializing um, from the beginning of the universe to what's going on in your brain while you're listening to me right now. And Reed was a part of that group too. So Reed was there uh, via my computer day after day after day with me, and we were throwing these ideas around. He was a graduate student at Harvard in the chemistry department. He went on to McKinsey and Company, and how he ended up as a teacher of physics these days after his McKinsey adventures, I have found out, but he was very bright. Many believe that our universe was created from a series of simple rules, and my guest, Howard Bloom, is here to discuss how those rules may have come about. His book is called The God Problem, How a Godless Cosmos Creates. It's published by Prometheus. This is WNYC, WNYC.org. I'm Leonard Lopate. You begin your book by laying out a series of five heresies against the mainstream scientific community. And why do you consider them heresies? Well, they're heresies because, for example, when you were on with Sean Carroll yesterday, Sean Carroll will tell you 
that the second law of thermodynamics, that all things tend toward disorder, that all things tend toward entropy, that if you disagree with many, 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 many things in science, you can get away with it. But if you disagree with the second law of thermodynamics, there is no hope for you whatsoever. Well, heresy number three says the second law of uh, thermodynamics, the concept of entropy, is all wrong. So dramatically wrong that it is almost impossible to believe that any serious scientist ever believed it. So why did they all believe it? Well, you know, we all have our religions. Because it works, doesn't it? No, it doesn't work. Um, It doesn't work at all. Because, again, if you go back through the history of the universe we've been going over, um, what you discover is the universe is never falling down. The universe is always falling up. Even its greatest catastrophes are falls upward. Um, The universe, the quarks that we were talking about, the neutrons and protons, they self-assemble into atoms, into hydrogen, helium, and lithium. That's not a step toward disorder. That's a step toward major big-time order. Then the hydrogen, helium, and the lithium atoms fall together into galaxies. That's not a step toward disorder either. The galaxies collapse into stars. They become giant gravitational clenched fists. And stars are even a higher order. So the universe is constantly going up a staircase of form. And this theory, the second law of thermodynamics, says no, no, it's not. So why do all these smart people believe it to the point where they have been seriously attacking this book. Because concepts can sometimes get in the way of your perception. Often there are conceptual tools, sometimes there are conceptual hindrances. Once upon a time in the 1600s, in the, at the University of Bologna, there would be uh, a barber who would cut apart a human body and a lecturer who would stand on a lectern and lecture about what you were seeing. And the lecturer consistently lectured about an organ that wasn't there that wasn't there. And he lectured about it because it came out of Galen 1,500 years earlier. And rather than see what was there in front of his nose, he saw what was in the book by Galen because it had been given dignity and majesty over the course of time. But uh, the science has changed. And today, uh, you make your reputation by questioning all of the the basic assumptions. There are certain things you don't question, and one of them is apparently the second law of thermodynamics, and and that's why the second law of science is the truth is look at things right under your noses if you've never seen them before, and then proceed from there. Your first heresy says that Aristotle's law of identity a equals a is false. Well, if you type an a at nine o'clock in the morning, and you type another a at nine o one in the morning. The Earth has moved 17 miles around its axis in the time between those two A's. The Earth itself has moved 517 miles around the Sun. And the Sun, the whole solar system, has moved 864 miles around the core of the galaxy. Those two A's are not made of the same fluorescent pixels. They are not made of the same electrons hitting those pixels. They are not made of the same photons coming to your eye. And your mind was on very different things when it typed the two different A's. And context means everything in this universe. It's like the two A's in Shakespeare. Are they identical? Well, not really. One is pronounced A, one is pronounced E. One is part of a word that's a verb. It means shaking things. But I thought in Shakespeare it was to be or not to be. Yes. (laughs) That's the O's in Shakespeare. (laughs) But you can see that, that where you put a letter, there are only 26 letters in Shakespeare. And it's where they are placed, the context in which they are placed that makes them meaningful. You write that metaphor is the key to human understanding and that it's central to science. Absolutely central. Um, When I was uh, reading, I, I was stuck one night reading Aristotle's Posterior Analytics. And I was looking for what is an axiom? What is an assumption? Why, do they, why does an axiom have the magic powers of generation to generate corollaries? Um, and, um, and I suddenly ran across the entire program of modern science, most of its vocabulary, including its prejudices. And one of them was metaphor is not science. It's Aristotle who told that to us. We've been holding on to that idea for 2,300 years. Well, guess what? The most sacred science is Uh, physics. And in physics, the most sacred thing is the photon. And what is the photon? The photon is either a wave or a particle, depending on how you look at it. Well, what's a wave? It's a metaphor. And what's a particle? It's the smallest part into which you can mash a crumb. It's a metaphor. So quantum mechanics is all about metaphors? Yes. It's drawing a metaphorical connection between a bunch of mathematics and the real physical world. Your second heresy is that one plus one doesn't equal two. Okay, two guys are saying... No, no, I'm sorry. My kindergarten teacher told me that, and I believed it the rest of my life. Right, well, that's a good one. I mean, two guys are sitting around, it's 1835. They've noticed that if you put two jars of gas together and add a little heat, 
Um, according to Aristotle, who told us that if you reduce a thing... We're to really a, picking on Aristotle today. Oh, yes. We? Well, it turns out that Aristotle is responsible for m- much stuff, a huge, massive stuff. We haven't been questioning, Leonard, and that's a big mistake. In science, you're supposed to question everything. But I, but we no longer believe that bile is a, a basic uh, cause of disorders. Yes, we've gotten humans. over <laughs> a few old ideas, but there are some old ideas that we don't even know are ideas. We think they're endemic to the cosmos itself. One recurring concept in your book is that the is the idea that opposites are joined at the hip. Yes. Can you explain what you mean by that? Well, for example, there's and, a... And how that works with the law yeah. of thermodynamics? Well, um, black and white, um, night and day, are connected. There are two different aspects of the same thing, the earth and a shadow, the earth looking or staring into the sun and being trailed by a shadow. Um, in, um, in the body... There's a big parent molecule that divides into two daughter molecules. One of them is vasopressin. The other one is oxytocin. Vasopressin is a boundary-setting social hormone. Oxytocin is an inclusive, friendly um, social hormone. Two opposites. But they're two opposites that came from the same parent. Why? Because in general, opposites tend to be like the opposite ends of a curtain rod. And if you remove the curtain rod, They don't exist anymore. Um, So what you tend to have when we have dichotomous thinking is that you've got somebody who has seen one side of a problem and is exploring it thoroughly, and he claims it's the only side of the problem. Somebody else who is exploring the other side of the problem very thoroughly and claims it's the uh, the only real side of the problem. But the two are two two things struggling together to establish a synthesis, which was um, that was Hegel's. It re- wasn't really Hegel's idea. That was Marx's interpretation of Hegel. But okay, I, I'm, I'm, you, you started also in mathematics and. I was really bad in math, but what I do remember is you had this thing, X equals something, yes. and then you had to, to find out what X was. Right. And they equaled each other. They weren't right. opposites. They weren't contradictory. Right. No. Um, in fact, that's A equals A, Aristotle's law of non-contradiction. That law is all about equaling things. And algebra, you're absolutely right, is all about things equaling things. And no, there are no contradictions in the world of algebra unless you look at minus one and plus one. So I guess, yes, there are a few. But the biggest thing going on in algebra is that equal sign. And one of the things that this book questions is the reality of the notion of that kind of equality. Just one more thing, uh, the matter of dark matter, right. which, which uh, uh, most... Uh, astrophysicists are still unclear about right. it. They have theories. Right. You seem you feel that you've figured it out? No, dark energy is the one that I've figured out. Oh. Dark energy is the one that they use to account for that acceleration mm-hmm. that begins to occur after a certain point. And that's in the, the bagel existence. slope. And that's the, the, the bagel slope, exactly. Well, uh, we're on a slippery bagel slope, it seems. Okay. Well, what uh, projects are you currently working on? Well, I'm working on this book. You know, once it says in in the previous book, The Genius of the Beast, that if you do something you feel is going to in any way better humanity and you fail to sell it, you fail to promote it, you are committing a crime against the humans who could possibly be helped or saved. So right now I am in the promotion phase of this book. And I've got a date coming up in Brooklyn in, uh, uh, on the 8th, and I'm doing a date tonight in Manhattan. Um, so I'm just working my tail off to get these ideas, to drive these ideas home. And the ideas are included in Howard Bloom's latest book, The God Problem, How a Godless Cosmos Creates. It is published by Prometheus Books. Thank you so much for being with us Leonard, again. Leonard, big thanks. Thanks. <laughs>